Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. So with me today is Ramesh Donta. He is a best-selling author, a host of several popular podcasts, none of which are on caregiving. And we're going to actually talk today about first his mom's journey with his dad who had likely had Parkinson's, but we're mostly going to talk about how caregivers like ourselves can tell our story for publication. So thank you for joining me, Ramesh. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for having me here. So I'm very honored. Thank you. So give us the uh, give us your bio really quick, if that's possible, because you've been doing a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing a lot of things. So very quick uh, bio is, um, um, so I work for a large technology company in uh, the marketing, business development, and, and strategy. And in 2016 or so, I left. Uh, I wanted to do a lot of other things in life. And then afterwards, uh, I started a consulting company. Um, I wrote a couple of books. I started a few podcasts. And uh, so in the entrepreneurial world, I, I mentor and help uh, people uh, do whatever they want to do. Start a business, start write a book, uh, you know, start a podcast if they want to. Uh, so any of those things. Well, we connected because you have an upcoming book called The 60-Minute Podcast Startup. I think you got a couple of quotes from some crazy fighting memories podcast host. That's right, Jennifer. Actually, um, yeah, it's a little bit on that uh, how we connected, right? So um, I started this a series called the Sixty Minute Startup Series. The, my first book is called the Sixty Minute Startup in general about starting a business. The second one is a Sixty Minute Tech Startup, and I took that so uh, because once uh, you know the foundation is set and people started liking the concepts, I said I can take that approach to anything and a Sixty Minute Podcast Startup. Because I have done, you know, at least two podcasts, and then they're all done uh, with only sixty minutes a day uh, within thirty days. That's a concept, right? So just get it out there. And then I was reaching out for other successful podcast hosts who I could feature in the book. And then I put a call out there, and then some lady called Jennifer Fink responded and said, "Hey, this is how I started the podcast. This is what I do." And I said, "Wow, this is a great story." Well, thank you. It's it's. Not generally the typical way one starts a podcast, looking for one that served my needs and not finding it and then just insanely deciding to start it. But I have always been, I am a hybrid. I like to use that term. I have been half artist, half entrepreneur my entire life. Mm, and it took yeah. me a long, well, took me a good portion of my adult years to stop wishing I was more of one than the other. I've... I embraced probably 15 years ago the fact that I might not be the biggest, the, the best ph photographic artist or the best entrepreneur, but there are a lot of benefits to being good at, real, at both. So. Exactly. I mean, that is uh, the best way. If you can make a business out of something that you love, I mean, that is, and that's the best of both worlds. So we, when we connected, I asked you if you had a connection to the Alzheimer's or the caregiving world. And you said your mom took care of your dad in India, which I haven't talked to anybody in India. I have talked to people across the globe though. So tell us a little bit about your parents. I know that's not related to our topic, but I like to keep it I like people to know like everybody's journey. Cause I think talking about our caregiving journey is important. Yeah. That wasn't something people did 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah, so it's it's interesting, uh, you know, how I uh, started looking at as a caregiving because um, my, both my parents are teachers, and then my, uh, my parents retired some time ago, and afterwards uh, they're enjoying life, and then they visited the U.S. multiple times, and uh, suddenly, about I would say maybe 2014-ish uh, or around that time frame. We didn't realize what was going on, but uh, we could see some symptoms of. Uh, uh, my uh, dad, while walking, he would, I mean, not a steady gait, uh, that's one. And then uh, now and then he would forget things. But we said, you know, we all forget things, right? So so we didn't make any connection at that time. And uh, once I remember when, when he was visiting us here in, here in Sacramento, we were walking and suddenly he was walking by himself. And then he fell on a, in a rose bush. And then 
So we thought he just fell because, you know, it's, it's, we could never make the connection. So, but now looking back at those things, now we could make connection that, oh, he had some kinds of these symptoms starting in 2014. Okay. And uh, 2016-ish or maybe, seven, I would say 17-ish, um, that was the last time he came here to the U.S. And then we celebrated his 70th birthday uh, while he was here in the U.S. And it all was going well when he went back things deteriorated very quickly, right? So it's a, uh, then he was unable to walk steadily and then uh, he was forgetting. Uh, again, uh, his long-term memory was really good, uh, but the short-term memory uh, was not that good. So he would forget like things like, what did he eat for breakfast, right? So things like those kinds of things. Um, and then uh, see, it's what happens in these situations is the realization, first you try to think, okay, it's not real, right? I mean, you know, you know all those different stages, you're in denial stage. I said, yeah, we don't know what's going on. So we'll, it'll, it'll pass. It, it'll be back to normal in the next week or so. But it was not the case. Um, and then, um, so my mom took my dad to a hospital. And then initially they came and said, it's Parkinson's, right? So it's like, first thing is, huh? Never heard of this. Because you only read about these things somewhere. Somebody else has these kinds of things. Never your family or somebody, right? So it's like a... Then you start digging into it. Okay, so now we're beginning to make connection. Then you accept that it's Parkinson's, right? And then they were treating for that one. And then I visited India and then we all went to the hospital. And then a doctor that morning, he forgot to take the Parkinson's disease, whatever medication they were giving. And uh, the doctor, the neurologist looked at uh, him and I said, he's not shaking. He didn't take the medicine. So something is not right. Right. So then again, we went through some diagnosis and we found out that these Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, the neurological uh, issues, they're all connected. So the first issue itself is the diagnosis. Right. So they cannot, uh, the doctors, however good they may be, not really great at diagnosing completely. This is what it is. So it's a little bit of that. I mean, that story, uh, that's how we, we came to realize. And of course, later on, a few more things that I've shared about what what happened. That's pretty typical. <laughs> it's, it's tough, right? And then my mom was by myself and we are two brothers. So we, both of us are here. Uh, so already we are feeling a little guilty about not being there to take care of our parents. And it was progressively getting worse. And uh, my mom was having a really tough time and uh, to deal where he would, you know, shriek and sometimes he would, you know, scream and things like that, right? So and then I uh, went back home and to see, I mean, there was a time I could remember mom said, I cannot handle any anymore, right? And I said, okay, fine. So that, that's one of the reasons I also branched out into this uh, leaving my job and, you know, so that I have more flexible uh, schedule. So I visited and then um, I looked at it and um, I don't know if I can share this, but there was one incident like, a, you know, he would, one day he would, he always wanted to shave for whatever reason. Like, uh, so he, my mom said, okay, you're, it's all shaven, but he wanted to do it. And then he was, she, she was worried that he would cut himself by shaving it. But he was adamant that he's, it's like, he's got a lot of hair on his face. He has to shave it. And I, I said, okay, fine, let him do it. Like, because otherwise he's getting angry that he's not being allowed to do what he was allowed to do. All right. So he wanted what he wanted to do. And I said, okay, let, let him shave. And then he, in the mirror, he was standing by himself for 20 minutes and 25 minutes, he just kept on doing it. And, and then, so those are all the idiosyncrasies that were there. And um, so um, we, we were trying to figure out what to do, but immediately we got some help at home to, so that my mom would get some help. We hired uh, one person, uh, I mean, definitely male and, and the young, uh, so that he could, uh, like, if, for example, if, if he was trying to push back uh, those kinds of things he could uh, help with that kind of stuff. So then things started getting a little better uh, after that with, with the help that we were able to get. Yeah, having help is extremely important. Extremely important. And then at least in the sense that it was like my mom could not even go to the bathroom because he would, he would, he always needed somebody to be around him, right? So so he was also a little scared uh, what was going on. So he always wanted her but at the same time, he was not allowing her to be herself, right? So it's like he was demanding you do this, you do this kind of stuff. So it, it, it's, it's almost like a 24 by 7. But once we got the help, we got a little better. 
And then afterwards, the neurologist who said uh, he's not uh, strictly Parkinson, then suggested doing, a, you know, implanting a shunt, a programmable shunt. So because they said there's a CSF, there's a fluid uh, buildup in the brain that they wanted to drain uh, using the shunt. And uh, so we went, uh, we, uh, he was 73, 74 at the time. So there was a decision about should he go through the surgery or not. But uh, given other things going on, the uncontrollable behaviors, we thought this is probably the best, uh, you know, to go through with this one. And did it help? Uh, yeah, it actually helped. So they, they, these neurological disorders, they said there are three symptoms, right? One is the gait, the, the walk itself. And the second one is the bladder control or lack thereof. And the third one is the memory loss, right? So to some extent, memory loss was not the painful thing, right? Because it's like, okay, fine. You don't remember things. That's not a problem. Uh, but there are also psychological issues in terms of getting angry, shouting at people, and you know, those things, right? Those, those were becoming a little uncomfortable, not able to deal. And then, of course, the walk itself, uh, right? So unable to even walk by himself and the bladder control. But the shunt, programmable shunt, helped with those two things, which is the walk, garden study, and then he got control of the, the bladder control, right? So those... I think uh, um, what the, sci uh, the good things about the shunt. Which I think is more Parkinson's because I've never heard anybody having that suggestion, that treatment suggested for Alzheimer's. Mm, so I'm I wondering see. if he had the Parkinson's dementia or some mix. Like you said, it's very difficult to, to just diagnose. And that's... One of the biggest challenges for those of us that have to take care of people like our parents and you helping your mom and it's not fun. So, and you said he passed away at 74. It's 74 in 2019 in November. And it's got a tie to my book as well. That was when my book was about first book was about to be launched a 60 minute startup. And it was um, at November 7th was the launch date. And then uh, the November, uh, it was getting, you know, worse. Then I, uh, symptoms were getting worse. So, so I left, uh, you know, um, to visit him in October uh, uh, sometime. And um, so we pushed out the launch. And then so November uh, 1st, uh, and that's the time, yeah, he passed away. November is a good month. We have a few birthdays in November in this household. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the family, I should say. <laughs> yeah, I see. Yeah, so basically the toughest thing was watching my mother. Um, I mean, it's, it's uh, to go through this journey. Uh, but uh, you know what? On the other side, she was always a strong woman, right? So she, to some extent, um, at least five, six years ago, she was handling most of the domestic aspects in terms of uh, the uh, rents coming in, the money management and all that stuff, right? He was totally out of it, right? So he was not doing it all. So it, it's, it's not that uh, she had to learn to do it. She's been doing it anyway. So that was it. But in terms of uh, uh, his, uh, you know, requiring assistance and 24 by 7 was really tough. Yeah, you don't expect that ever. We should think about it more as we age, as our population is aging, because there is a statistic that I like to tell people, remind my listeners, that 70% of us, seven zero, will need care before we die. Wow. And of course, most of us arrogantly, in, and I say that in the nicest way, feel like, well, I'm going to be in that 30%, but we discount the 30% that die before they need care, <laughs> which is not the entire 30%, but it's, it's a big number. So it's, it's definitely something to think about, plan for. And I know everybody's like, oh, I don't want to talk about that stuff. Once you've talked about it, it's it's you've you've discussed it, you've made decisions and you can move on and it's not a stressful thing anymore. And my listeners have known that I we I joke we are my family jokes now about our our end of life choices just because, mm. you know, I think it's a way of lightening, lighting, lightening. There we go. Making light of something that's not that you don't really want to think about. You don't want to think about exactly. But, you know, I don't know about Indian culture, but Western culture kind of treats death as a failure, which is really stupid because it's inevitable. And when we stop thinking that way, then we can we can make plans and we can talk about things that are uncomfortable. Like we 
did our trust during my husband and I did our our estate planning during the pandemic. I see. And we found out that we were not as far behind as we thought we were. We were actually ahead of the average person, which in your mid 50s is not saying much. That's great. And one of the questions he asked was if, okay, so you want everything that you, all of your stuff will go to your daughter. Great. What happens if she dies first? And I remember looking at him and going, well, that's not a very nice question. <laughs> and it did take a while to kind of think about like, okay, what do we want to happen? You know, she's got a fiance, like maybe now that we're out of the pandemic, finally, maybe they'll actually get married, you know, and, and if they get married, then if that, you know, and you think about it for a while, it kind of, you know, percolates in the back of your head. And then you realize, heck, he's been in the family for almost 10 years. Like, ah, if something happens to us, he can have it, you know, and it's just poof, no more stress. And I don't have to think about her going first. You know, so I hope she doesn't because that okay. would be terrible. But, yeah. you know, my dad did precede his mom. Oh, is that right? That was, huh. You know, so it's like it's not once you've thought about it and you've discussed it, it's it's like it's like a workout. It's kind of kind of icky while you're doing it. But now you feel good that you're done. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think same thing. We went to a trust a couple of years ago. Same questions. Yeah, it's like. You know, that one, I wasn't expecting that one, which I should have, because it's kind of stupid that I wasn't. The other but, question you know. is, like, uh, how do you, like, if you're in the, you know, ventilator or whatever, what do you want? You know, what kind of option? My wife was like, uh, it's like I'm, I was very clear what I wanted. I wanted it to be taken off. I don't want to be in, you know, dead, but forever. And she was like, no, you cannot choose that. I said, you know, I, yeah, you that, can. <laughs> does it sound appealing to me? It's, it gets, there's too many gray areas, but I was blessed with, I talked to a gentleman who, he doesn't cre credit himself with creating an Alzheimer's living will. Hmm. It came to him. I see. And he thinks that it was divinely transmitted to him. Hmm. It's, you know, I will link that in the show notes so people can go back and listen to that one. But it talks about like people like my mom at the end, you know, like it isn't like, Re fixing her broken leg wasn't going to help fix her brain and doing the surgery might have caused more problems. And I had always told my family, my husband, my daughter, and the almost son-in-law that if my mom got pneumonia, we were calling hospice. We weren't going to worry about it. I knew that my mother would kill me if I prolonged her late stage Alzheimer's. Yeah, and I yeah. told them this repeatedly because I said, I know if it happens, I'm going to waver because mm. my sister would be like, no, we have to give her the antibiotics and just fix her. It's like, no, we don't have to. Yeah. And I know a lot of people probably think that's horrible, but that's where all these conversations are important because yeah. I knew what my mom would want. Yeah, exactly. And I knew it would be hard to, to actually execute it if that came down to it. So thankfully she made it really easy. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I made my decision. So I think that at least uh, if you are in the will and trust, if you make the decisions, it probably is easy on the survivors that they don't have to go through that. Exactly. So you were saying it was hard to watch your mom go through this whole thing. And that ties kind of into the second half of our conversation about, I think it's really important that caregivers tell their stories. And I'm kind of in a unique position to be between the Caregivers who are taking care of a spouse, generally, and the millennials, because I'm a Gen Xer. I almost say Gen Z because I forget, get confused. And maybe you're a Gen Z. You didn't know. You just don't know it. Uh, maybe mentally. <laughs> In my heart, I'll, I'll be a Gen Z, even though my daughter's a millennial. But it's interesting because I, the way the different generations approach it, it's it's very different, which I guess really shouldn't be a surprise, especially probably for somebody like you who's written Definitely. books and been in the tech tech niche, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And I'm I'm gonna tell this story and I'm I hope I don't regret this, but I was planning on writing a book before I started the podcast. And I told okay. you a little bit of this off before we were recording. So I'm going to tell the whole audience this and maybe it'll keep me on track and you're going to tell me how to manage this. That's the, making yourself accountable. Uh, exactly. Uh, you know? It's like I'm nervous because <laughs> I've never written anything more than like a blog post or 
you know, I majored in business in, in college, so I don't think I wrote any like major essays or reports or anything. And I've been an entrepreneur forever, so I only write what I want to write. So. Yeah, you have a lot of stories, I'm sure. You can tell, yeah. I do. And I knew. So this is how my brain works. I was doing my workout and they were talking about the before times, live concerts, which reminded me of the Coldplay concert that we saw in 2016, yeah. which preceded all of the stuff that happened with my parents that my audience mm. knows. So I'm doing my workout, thinking about what they're talking about, thinking about the before times and I'm thinking about today and what am I going to ask you and how are we going to make this a conversation that's beneficial to my audience? And literally the brain is going back and forth, back and forth. Honest to goodness. And I knew this would happen. I knew that if and when a book was in me, it would pop out. And it popped out a week and a half ago, maybe a little more. Fully, like not fully formed, but super like clear. Yeah. But I'm, I'm going to tell you the story that, that preceded the podcast where I was thinking about writing a book. So my mom was in memory care and she had her dog with her dog was named Misty. She was a miniature poodle. Miniature poodle should weigh 15, 16 pounds. Misty weighed 28. Wow. <clears throat> so I called Misty fats cause nobody cared. The dog didn't care. My mom didn't care. So, cause it's just like insane. And the executive director and the med techs where mom lived mm -hmm. and I put together a process to get to keep Misty from being fed by all the residents because that oh, was the problem. <laughs> because when you're double your body weight as a dog, hygiene problems happen. Mm. And we won't go into any more details about that because it was gross. <clears throat> so there was a resident where mom lived. Her name was Lola. Sweet, mm. wonderful gal. Mm. If she could see it, it was hers. So you made sure to hang on to your purse or whatever belongings. If you saw Lola, Coming down the hall, you made sure your belongings were clutched to your body so that she didn't walk off with them because she would fight you for them. Mm. Like she tried to pick up my purse one day and I tried to be very sweet and nice. Oh no, Lola, that I think that one's mine. Let me help you find yours. I swear she was gonna smack me with my own oh purse. My God. So I am literally trying to shove my mom's dog into her room at dinner huh. time and the dog is not having it because she knows that she's about to get banished from the dining room. <laughs> and all of a sudden, and Lola's talking to my mom. And all of a sudden I hear, if you touch me one more time, I'm going to knock your block off. Wow. I'm like, Holy crap. My mother's about to have a fight. And I'm like, she's only been here six months. She's not coming to live with me. Oh my God. What am I going to do? Thankfully, she was standing right next to the door that went to the courtyard. I literally shoved her into the courtyard. She was so angry. She was shaking. Oh, my god. And goodness. I just kept saying, oh, it's so sad. Lola's mind is so bad. Oh, she just loves Misty so much. It's so sad. Her mind is bad. Over and over and over for about three minutes. I probably sounded like a lunatic. And then, of course, and I, I said, dementia for the win, because my mom forgot what happened. Mm -hmm. Bless. That was a blessing. And she looked in the window and she goes, oh, I think they're serving dinner. I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> wow. And I drove see, home. see, look at that. That's a great story. Oh, but it doesn't end there. Got better. So my dad, I did not realize, was having some cognitive struggles mm -hmm. in 2016. He signed them both up for the NRA. This is not something that my household approves of. We won't go into the politics of the NRA. I get home because I had had my parents' mail forwarded to my house while my dad was, <clears throat> excuse me, on hospice. There is a giant postcard, like six by nine inches, black background, angry red font. It's addressed to my mom and it says free gun. I was like, oh, my Lord, oh my, my life. Lord. What happened to my life? So I put this story on Facebook and one of my past photography clients who's a business coach said, you should write a book. I said, well, I think I might. Except I'm going to wait till after. And I've talked to so many authors and, so, and I've read so many caregiver books and, you know, anthologies, novels, like there's a lot more out there than most people are aware of. Maybe yeah. not my audience. My audience should be aware of it, but for the general population. And so, like I said, like less than two weeks ago, 
I, I told everybody, like, if the book is in me, it will pop out. It and it did. So for other people like me who think we should tell our stories, want to tell the story, have a book in them that pops out when they're doing a Peloton workout, where do we start? How do you tell your story for publication so that, like, that story is interesting. Now I got to, like, expand on it. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly. You got to, uh, um, yeah, expand on it. I think uh, that's a good question. Um, the fundamentally, of course, the books can be all right. So fiction versus nonfiction, right? So that's the broadest categories. So first, you figure out what do you want to do with your books, right? Is it more you just want to tell your story, or you want to make the uh, in a book a foundation for something larger, right? So in the nonfiction side, there are a lot of people who have built empires uh, based on a book, right? So they have courses, they have training, they have coaching, and in all kinds of things, right? So that's one direction. Um, and but if you if, uh, if you want to make books as a business, right? You can make a uh, in a book as a business, and uh, but it's not the books itself the business. That's a fundamental thing, right? Well, that's good so, to know. So you got to figure out what is the place for your book in your overall life of what you're doing. Okay. If you just want to be an author of just writing a book and you just want to tell the stories, but don't expect much beyond that one. Okay, why nobody bought it? Why this? And it's like, why it's not a bestseller and all that stuff? Because your, your purpose is just wanted to tell your story, right? In my case, um, it, it's more about um, wanting to be a, and build my credibility out there, okay? So I've been uh, publishing, writing a lot of blogs and articles like you did and in some areas, and I always wanted to find my own angle. My angle was uh, making technology relatable to everyday people, right? So I just wanted to make it funny. You know, that's how my writing started. I always wanted to, so find your own angle. Like it, It's like, how do you tell your story? You tell your stories in a funny way. I mean, Jennifer, I, I told you the way you talk, is it's not that you want to be funny, but it comes out in a, in a funny way, the way you have a way with words, the way you put them together. So I could see that's your angle, right? So you, you, you could uh, make it funny, you could make it serious, but send a serious message in a funny way. So once you find that angle, I mean, that differentiates you from the other people, okay? So I think once you figure those out, like what's the purpose, why, why do you want to do it? What kind of a genre you want to do it? And then the other thing that people have to decide is, do they want to go self-publishing route or do they want to get published, discovered by the major publishers? As all of us know, the getting discovered by publishers is not an easy task. And then Stephen King probably wrote some, you know, lots of books before he was discovered, right? So, so those things you should be prepared mentally if that's what you want to do, right? But the self-publishing with the uh, likes of Amazon out there, it's quite easy, okay? And it's not that expensive uh, as well, right? So literally, you can self-publish your book for, I mean, if you want to do it, less than $100, right? But if you want to do a really good job at it, of course, you will spend more money on the book cover and then editing and proofreading, you know, all the other elements. If you're good at it, you can do it, but, you know, you, you probably want some outsourcing help on those areas. So as a caregiver, I think I would, I would uh, think, if, let's say caregiving is your business. It's a profession. Right? So figure out, is the book towards a, a business, a, pro a profession? Or is it just by itself, uh, if you're a home caregiver, like Jennifer, you are not a professional caregiver, right? So you, you took care of your parents, but you want to tell your story to help others, right? So there is no monetary, uh, you know, I, goal to itself, but it's something that goes with your podcast, right? So I think those are the kinds of things. I don't know if I'm um, I'm able uh, able to help with with these kinds of decisions. Well, those are things that I think we all have to make on our own. My goal is well, the idea that popped out of my head, which I'm still reluctant to talk about on the air, <laughs> is it's all designed to help people. It's from the angle of where I'm at right now, and. It's not a topic that people have talked about. So I mm. haven't seen it 50, 70, or you know, 100 times through my friends at All's Authors. And I think it's 
Well, it's an angle that isn't necessarily going to be highly uh, saturated. I guess okay. I should just tell you what the angle is. So the idea is caregiver reentry, post pandemic, post caregiving. Who am I now? Okay. That's that's the title and the subtitle, and the artwork on the front would be a parachute with a puzzle piece underneath it. <laughs> Told you, you half yeah. entrepreneur, half artist. It all comes out all at once. That's great. <laughs> so. Yeah, you already thought through all these things, right? So, which is great. And the other thing that you are also alluding to is who's your audience? Who is it meant for, right? What will they do with that information that you're going to put in the book? Or what do you want them to do? I, I think for myself, I want people to know that it, where, the way I feel, and I've read like on social media that other people in my position of recent past caregiving is like complete confusion and it's totally normal. Like there are many podcast episodes of mine where I'm like, I am ready for mom's journey to be over. And then mom's journey was over and I was like, wait a minute. I'm not sure I was ready. And it's like, what the hell? <laughs> like, this is like schizophrenia. I don't understand. And then of course you couple that with the pandemic. And I retired from portrait photography because of a lot of reasons, but mostly because I couldn't work last year. And it was from the last recession for the last past 10 years, it's just been harder and harder to make a good living at it. So I finally mm. said, the heck with it. I'll just time to move on, do something else is kind of what I decided. But I haven't figured out exactly what something else is beyond like in addition to or beyond the podcast. So I'm still in that. Who am I now phase, which is yeah. fine. Originally, I kind of had a panic attack about like, I don't, I got to figure out what I'm doing with my life. Yeah. Like, no, I don't. I mean, I do, but I'm, there's not like a deadline. It's not like a, you know, timer's going to go this off. Time and I'm, you got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, just cause I'm going to be 55 this fall doesn't mean I got to know now I got to know by my birthday. Yeah. No, those are false deadlines. And once I took a deep breath and realized Everything is fine. We have plenty of money. Dogs are happy. Everybody's happy. It's fine. I don't have to I don't have to make a decision right this second. That's when I'm like, well, if the book happens, it happens. And then it, the idea popped out and I'm like, I really like this idea because I have not seen people talk about what it's like after when you get mm. to the other side of the mountain. And so many of us had to get there through a pandemic. Obviously, there better not be another giant audience or giant a big pool of potential authors for the next pandemic. <laughs> no, but actually, the, the, it's a very timely, right? So, so I think U.S. has got a very unique angle, which is it's not been explored because we didn't have a pandemic before. So this is, uh, so you're coming out and you have expertise in, uh, you know, the care and you had time to think through these things. So one of the other aspects I will also talk about, we as writers and authors, they want to think about writing and then, you know, a book, right? But that's only one piece of it. But the other piece of it is marketing a book. So unfortunately, uh, many authors don't think about that. It's, it's one of those things. If there's this, uh, in the technology world, there is something called a, if I build it, they will come, right? So it's like, a, I will build the best product out there, whatever the best could be, people will come and buy. You know, if the world doesn't work that way. You nope. have to market. Uh, you know, whatever you're building. The same thing goes for the book too. So you have to bake in the marketing piece of the book right from get-go. See, that's not something I was considering until we started talking about it. And then I'm getting more ideas for popping. So <laughs> the thing is, let's say you write the, you know, what you consider the best book. What if, like, so what's the point if only five people read it, right? So it's discouraging to you, number one, I mean, you got a great idea, but what if you make it, you know, uh, available, like somehow through marketing, you know, once you learn about marketing, what it is about. So let's say instead of five people, like 100 people read it. So it, it, it serves a purpose. I'm not talking purely of money, right? It's not that money will come, but as a, uh, you know, as a writer, you, your goal is you want to be read, right? You, you want the book to be read by as many people as, as possible. Right. So, and then especially with the eBooks and all that stuff, even the cost of printing a book is not there. So once you, at least initially you prime the pump with respect to more people reading the book, 
then you know use some marketing uh, you know techniques and those are the kinds of things uh, i come from a marketing background so i am i'm to some extent a marketer first an author second so it's it's uh, that's how i appro- approach it i think uh, people should uh, uh, think of that way so because some people especially you know some writers may think oh marketing is is bad i don't want to you know it's like a man i don't want to spend any time on promoting it, it's it's not you know it's it's a I want people to discover me. It's fine. I mean, I, I will not find fault with that thinking, but um, the purpose will not be served. So that makes sense. And one of the original thought processes I had after starting the podcast was to do speaking engagements. And I had planned on launching that in, well, I planned on it January, 2020, we moved and then the pandemic happened. Yeah. And part of me is like, Mm, I don't really know if I want to do that still, maybe over Zoom. I don't know. Partly because I like being able to podcast wherever I have a good internet connection, which I have not yet ventured out of this particular specifically designed room for the sound. But if I wanted to, if I was able to, we're supposed to be in Taipei this week, but that didn't happen. The convention got canceled. But I've seen how people record podcasts in hotel rooms. I'm like, I could do that. And then I'm not tied to other people's schedules. Mostly. Yeah. A little bit. So I'm, I'm reconciling those thoughts, but I'm wondering if talking to caregivers at the end stages or after their person is gone, that actually right now seems a bit more appealing. Maybe that's because that's the position that I'm personally in. I don't know. Something to think about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as part of that, one of the exercises that I I did myself and I advise people to do is what's called a persona, right? The, your reader's persona, right? Who are they, right? So defining that persona, and in terms of what is the you know demographics, what age uh, you're then, so almost like you define your Jennifer Fink, the ideal reader persona kind of thing, right? So she lives in Brentwood. She is 55 years old. And then, uh, you know, it's, uh, she worked uh, for herself or whatever. But, but my point is like defining the persona helps uh, identify, you know, uh, uh, fine tune your message a lot more. So that's one of the things. And by the way, all the things that you're talking is something for me, it happened, right? So I have a podcast, I have books, and then the courses that I'm building on, and then the coaching, right? All these are connected. Right. So the the thing that I could talk to your caregiver audience is that, you know, you you have a way to connect everything that you do. Right. It doesn't have to be monetary. If if, if that's not your goal is, it could be more to reach your on audience. Right. Broaden your message. Right. Through multiple channels, there are readers, books, and then listeners, the podcast. Right. So, and then the course that you offer. Uh, so, for example, you could, let's say, decide, I don't want to do portrait port- photography myself, but I want to teach others how to do photography. Let's say you have a training course, right? So, and then uh, you could have a book on that connected. Uh, so all these are, in, in my mind, they're all connected. And so do you think it's important that people go through all those steps? Or I'm assuming it's it's fine to write a book kind of as a catharsis for what you've gone through self publish and then just be happy with the thousand people that read it. I mean, that's valid, right? I don't want to do that. Perfectly valid. Exactly. (laughs) My entrepreneurial side is like, no, 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 that's not okay. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's what your other brain and your right brain says, no, that, you know, why are you doing it? Right. So by the way, that's what I'm saying. It's which is that it's perfectly fine. You want to get the book, a story out there and then literally you write your book and then uh, you know some of this KD- KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing Platform, gives you tools that you could do to yourself. You can format the book in the format that they want and they will print it on demand for you. And then you could use their own free uh, cover image maker. So literally you could, uh, you know, for almost zero dollars, you could publish a book, right? But there's a whole different side of you know, how many people will read it, right? So that's where uh, your marketing uh, thing comes into picture. Makes sense. That's what I majored in in college was business administration marketing back before 
the internet. <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. I mean, exactly. That's what I'm saying, right? So, it's, it's, for me, if you don't think about marketing, uh, the primary purpose of writing book is lost, and I could be in the minority. And the reason it's lost is because your goal is to make sure that your book is available to as many people as possible, and as many people actually read the book, right? Otherwise, you know, you know, why do you want to write a book? That means this whole making it available, it's called distribution or the place in marketing, right? And then how do you price it? You know, how do you promote it? And then so all of them are kind of as pieces of the marketing um, that are relevant for a writer. It makes sense. And I have one question that I don't, I don't know if you have the answer to. If you go the self-published route as a way of basically proof of concept, you do the you write it, you publish it, self-publish, you market it, you you start developing enough people that are buying it. Is that does that preclude you from then going to a traditional publishing house? Or because now it's technically published, so they don't want to do it. I, I mean, I'm wondering if that proof of concept thought is incorrect. No, it is. It's correct. So there are a couple of ways. Um, for example, I'll take a, a Amazon as an example. And then sorry if you hate Amazon, so there's not <laughs> nothing I can do because uh, that is the largest uh, publisher out there. 70% of the books get sold through Amazon. So, and that's where my experience is anyway. So, all right. So here is what it is. So they have something called a KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. And then, uh, and then they have something called a KDP Select Program where you could sign up with them. And then in that case, the eBooks, are exclusive to Amazon, right? You cannot sell as long as you're in the program. It's it's at three months or six months along those lines. But as long as you're in the program, you're exclusively selling your eBooks on Amazon. But your print books, you could sell through multiple channels. So there's no exclusivity there. So that's for that book. Let's call, you, 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 let's say caregiver's guide is, let's call, is, is the, the post-pandemic caregiver's guide. Let's call your book, okay? And you published it, self-published it, and then ebook is only through Amazon, but uh, other ones you can go to Barnes and Noble. You can do, you know, Ingram Spark and uh, the other traditional publishers are there. You could do that. So that's if uh, that's one way. The other way, if you don't participate in the KDP Select, like you just only publish through the the KDP in, in the sense, then you're not making it exclusive to them. And there are other ebook distribution platforms, so you could sell your ebook on Barnes and Noble as well. If uh, if that's a choice you want to make, right? So, but these are all self-published. And the other question is, okay, now there is a big four or five publishers out there, random house, like, a, can I go to random house and then publish through them as well? There is nothing that prevents you from going to random house, but the random house will think, why do I want to publish the same post-pandemic caregiver's guide if it's also available to them. So they want to control a lot more aspects of the book if they're going to publish it for you. Makes sense. I like it's kind of what I assumed, but I, that question popped into my head. So I thought it was worthy yeah. of asking. So for somebody like me, a hundred percent novice to this thing, this writing thing, <laughs> that being an author, would you suggest doing the self-publishing or going through the painful process of trying to find a publisher knowing it's not going to be pleasant <laughs> yeah so my my bias is towards self-publishing and, and the reason i'll tell you the why i would say that right so the inertia sets in right so uh for whatever we want to do we want to start a business you want to write a book you want to start a podcast you go into the analysis paralysis oh it's possible what if i get picked by this maybe that i'll get millions of dollars and and then you keep going through this and then you spend days and days goes into weeks and months. And then, you know, at some point you give up. Right. So that is the danger to uh, working that way. And unless you're very disciplined, determined, um, you have, you know, the will to go through lots of rejections. Right. So then th that's the otherwise self-publishing is literally, you know, get you out the door in the quickest time possible. So my advice to people is, just get your first book. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just get it out. That way you go through the process and then the, the butterflies, you know, fly away, right? So you're no longer, you don't, uh, no longer, uh, you know, anxious about, you know, how it's going to be there. Whether it's going to be, you know, hit or not, doesn't really matter. The expectations are not there. You just want to get it out there. Okay. 
in the process, of course, you will try to make it better and all those kinds of things. So my recommendation advice, it's again, I'm biased, is towards self-publishing. Is that what you did? That's what exactly I did. So essentially, uh, you wouldn't believe it. I published the book on uh, literally uh, 30 days. And then that's why. So it's, it's like, it, it, this is not magic. It's not rocket science. You break the thing into, uh, that's what the 60 minute concept comes into picture. So break whatever you're trying to, let's say a podcast, right? You want to start a podcast, break it into 60 minute pieces, something that you do every day. Like, a, so let's say today, you want to identify what's a recording equipment for your podcast. So that's all you, you do the research for 60 minutes, you figure it out. That's what you want to do. So likewise in the book also, you know, I, uh, by the way, um, I'm not trying to sell it, but I have a course based on this concept of how do you write a book, right? So break it into, you know, 60 minute pieces and then try to do it in 30 days, right? Literally or at most six working weeks. And and then so uh, one day you only think about your audience, your customer persona. One day you, you go and research about, um, uh, you know, how to format the book, right? So those are all pieces that are broken down. And then mechanically, you keep doing it, you know, every day, set aside 60 minutes, which I hope you can find in your, in your day, and then just do it, but no, don't strive for perfection, right? Don't try to make it perfect. Just get the task out. And then literally try to launch it in, you know, a, a month or two at most. Well, that's excellent advice. And for my audience, we have an upcoming episode with Lauren Dykovitz, who wrote Life, Love, and Alzheimer's. And she self-published both of her books. I think the second one is out. I have to check with her before her episode is published. But hers comes out after yours. So that's kind of an interesting tie-in. We don't talk about book writing books in her episode, but that is how she proceeded. So mm. I have a, I have a person in my, my corner that I can also talk to. I don't have to harass you. <laughs> no, no, actually I'm always available by the way. So Jennifer, yeah, please do. Right. So it's, it's, uh, um, I'm open uh, to your audience and if anybody wants to, to engage with me, um, you know, rameshdamta.com is where, you know, please, uh, you know, send a, a message to me or, you know, email to me. And, um, yeah. Awesome. And that, uh, website's in the show notes. And with that, I'm going to let Ramesh go. And hopefully we didn't disturb the dog who has been snoring on the couch next to me. <laughs> Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.